Okay, it is noon, which means we can get started now. Um, so hello, everybody, and uh, thank you all so much for joining us for today's program, Streetcars and Their Legacy in Washington, D.C. My name is Melissa Loriano, and I serve as the Programs Associate for the D.C. Preservation League. First, I just want to thank you all so much for your continued support as members of DCPL. We are grateful for your dedication to historic preservation and our organization, and we hope that you enjoy this benefit of your membership. Before we uh, officially get started here, I just want to share a few brief uh, technical notes about how today's presentation is going to work. So please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to submit any questions uh, to our speaker. After the presentation, we're going to have a Q&A session where I will collect the questions that you all submitted and ask them verbally of our speaker. If we don't get to everybody's questions today, I will make a note of the ones that we um, didn't get to that were submitted. But if you have any other questions following the presentation, please uh, email them to us at info at dcpreservation.org and we will pass them along to our presenter. So I am so pleased to introduce you all to today's speaker. John DeFerrari was born and raised in Washington, D.C. and has a lifelong passion for local history. He has a master's degree in English literature from Harvard University and has worked for many years for the federal government. In addition to penning the popular Streets of Washington blog, John is a trustee of DCPL, member of our Landmarks Committee, and is the author of three books, Lost Washington, D.C., published in 2011, Historic Restaurants of Washington, D.C., Capital Eats, published in 2013, and Capital Streetcars, Early Mass Transit in Washington, D.C., published in 2015. And with that, I'm so happy to pass things over to John. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you for that kind introduction. And thank you everyone for, for signing in. Um, it's, it's good to be here, talk about streetcars, one of my favorite subjects. Um, and today I'm going to talk, I'm gonna give a kind of a two-part talk. I'm gonna talk about the history of, of the streetcar system in DC and fill you in on, on why it happened and, and what happened. And, and then I'm gonna talk about uh, the various remnants of the system that still remain with us, which are uh, perhaps more extensive than, than people might realize at first, at first uh, glance. Um, and a couple of items even there are, are really preservation um, interest points right now. So we'll get to those at the end. Um, with that, so uh, the, uh, the streetcar system in DC, it started, what did we have before streetcars? We had, uh, since around 1830 or so, we had omnibuses, which are, you can see in the illustration here, are these little things that look like stagecoaches. And they were, they were the only public transit available for, for uh, a number of decades in the 19th century. Um, Washington, of course, being a planned city uh, is very dispersed, much more so than cities that grow up, uh, have grown up organically from one central spot. And so there's always been a lot of need for people to move around the city and a, really a need for transit. And um, these om early omnibuses did not do the, the trick very well. They were they were few and far between. They were very uncomfortable and cramped. Uh, they just weren't weren't very good. Uh, the first streetcars came uh, in during the Civil War, 1862. Uh, the 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 view here is of Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, this photo is probably dated to about 1868, just after the 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 war. But you can see those original uh, tracks on Pennsylvania Avenue. And they were, they were laid out very quickly. Um, there had been talk of starting the streetcar system for years throughout the 1850s when Congress finally authorized the first company in 1862, they required them to, to get up and operating within two months, an amazing period of time for the company to organize itself, to buy rails and and, and uh, uh, acquire horses and, and cars and set everything up along Pennsylvania Avenue in two months. And then they added two more north-south routes on 7th Street and 14th Street. And the whole system of three routes was up and running within six months. Uh, an amazing accomplishment and 
uh, a huge success that uh, that um, uh, everyone everyone used the car as they were financially and, and every other way, a great success. Here's the second um, part of the second railroad, which was set up two years later, went around uh, the Capitol. You see a uh, charming little uh, uh, one horse uh, car here stopped at in front of the Capitol. Uh, that was the Metropolitan Railroad. There were, um, and there were several uh, different independent streetcar railroads set up. So, um, so I, I stop right here and say, why streetcars? I got this this photo of of one of the Metropolitan Railroad cars parked on on Boundary Street, uh, what is now Florida Avenue. This is right up up near. By, the, by what would be the Universal Building uh, on Florida Avenue, just south of the Hilton. Uh, it looks a little different. Um, so, okay, why streetcars? The, uh, the whole purpose of setting up these um, systems uh, in, in, in cities where you have these, these contraptions on rails, uh, it really comes down to the need to maximize the, the power of your, of your engines, the horses. So how can you get the most pulling power out of a horse? Uh, in, on, uh, back when you, in the omnibus day or, or any kind of wagons or carriages, um, uh, you know, a horse could pull about three tons worth on a good, you know, well-paved flat road. Uh, but on rails, a horse can pull 10 tons, more than three times as much. And so that was the, that was the advantage of, of of uh, setting up streetcars, you you leverage the power of the horses, um, and the, the cars can be larger. They can be more comfortable. The whole system could of using horses to pull people around just works much better. So, uh, uh, street railways uh, took off. We've got here. This is just a map, give you a sense of how many there were in the in the days of horse drawn streetcars. Uh, we've got color coded five different. Uh, independent companies running uh, streetcars throughout the city uh, in 1880. Um, these are all competing uh, separate private companies. You couldn't just transfer from one to the other. Um, and uh, they all, they all uh, uh, did lots of business. Uh, everybody rode on the, on the streetcars. Uh, I found an anecdote where uh, President Grant would get on even uh, almost uh, just for relaxation, ride the streetcar down Pennsylvania Avenue to the the, the foot of, of Capitol Hill, and he'd he'd stand out in front uh, with the operator and smoke a cigar on the platform out front and and ride along the streetcar. Uh, now, uh, streetcars uh, with horses uh, like this uh, were 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 very limited, of course. They, uh, you may have noticed in the, the, uh, that map back here that the, the lines only go as far as the L'Enfant City. Um, and that's in part because the horses could not pull streetcars up steep hills. Uh, it was just uh, impossible. And so the lines did not go that far. Um, the horses, of course, you know, they, they were they were relatively slow. Um, a car like this one here, drawn by two horses, it could hit, uh, you know, on a nice open stretch uh, along a, a city block, it might hit as much as four miles an hour, often going slower than that. Uh, so it took, they were very slow moving. Um, and the, the horses uh, took a lot of care. They, they uh, the horse could only actually run for about a three hour sh shift uh, each day. Um, it's a grueling work, um, really, actually really hard on the horses. Um, and that's all, there's a whole story behind that. I don't have time for today, but very interesting about concerns that developed about the well-being of the horses. There was even um, uh, an, an epizootic in 1872. That's a animal version of an epidemic or a pandemic, you could say, uh, although it, it moved uh, it moved down through the, the East Coast in 1872 and hit Washington uh, right around election time. 1872 was also an election year and uh, all the horses were sick from this flu-like uh, uh, disease that, that just spread throughout uh, the city. Um, 
all the streetcar lines were shut down uh, for a week or two. Um, and um, and fortunately, uh, uh, the vast majority of the horses did recover from, from that. So if you were worried about the horses, they were mostly okay. But it uh, certainly uh, a limit to, a, to keeping a transportation system running. So um, Congress, by the 1880s, it was clear that there should be a, a, a mechanized replacement. And, and Congress actually mandated that that DC streetcars move away from horses and by 1889 they should all be using some mechanized method. So we had um, we had some experiments on different types of, of mechanized streetcars. Uh, one of them was the cable system which we had here's a, a view of a cable car set up uh, for 7th Street part of the original Washington and Georgetown Railroad which switched to cable in 1887. Um, and cables, uh, just uh, very, very quickly, the concept there, you've got the, the sort of uh, equivalent of a, of a clothesline system running under the street, a cable that, a cable loop that is powered down at one end by a power station and runs continuously. And the cars have a, a grip, a metal bar that that reaches down into the slot in the street, grabs onto that moving cable, and that's what pulls the cars along. Um, and uh, it was a, uh, uh, it allowed for much uh, larger cars. Here you've got two cars connected that could, could, could run on the system. Uh, but it was, a, it was a cantankerous, a complicated, uh, and very expensive system to, to operate. It wasn't really the best option and then uh, that little brief period of cable cars in DC ended uh, very dramatically in October 1897 when the powerhouse uh, for the cable system uh, burnt dramatically at a nighttime fire. Uh, it, it, uh, there was descriptions of, of the brightness of the fire as, as this uh, uh, cable car uh, uh, powerhouse went up in flames. And of course the cars were still running throughout the city. And at one point a, a huge beam crashed down onto the, onto the steam uh, powered system and, and shut, it, shut it off completely. And then all the cable cars in the city that were running on it all suddenly stopped in their tracks. Uh, so it was quite dramatic. It actually, uh, the end of, of cable was, was not uh, a bad thing because it was very clear by that time that electric power was going to be the way that that was going to be the the, the power system of the future, uh, not, not as as complicated and 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 hard to operate as cable. And here you've got a picture of the very first DC electric uh, streetcar. Uh, this is opening day in in 1888 uh, in uh, uh, October 1888. Just uh, the, the scene here is just uh, 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 east of Mount Vernon Square. And this is the, um, the Eckington and Soldiers Home Railway uh, just getting started. So this was a streetcar system that went up New York Avenue and turned north up to the brand new development of Eckington just outside of the, uh, just past Florida Avenue. So it was outside of the original Washington City. And it was, uh, the first streetcar suburb in, in, in Washington. And uh, the, this railway uh, this kicked off a, a new phenomenon that took place throughout the 1890s of uh, streetcar railroads being set up at, in, in conjunction with brand new suburbs throughout the, throughout the District of Columbia and even beyond. Uh, so this was the first. Um, Eckington was set up the same uh, the same developer uh, uh, set up both the suburb as well as the street railway that went out to it and they advertised that you could get from the heart of the city out to your suburban home in 12 minutes and uh, so this was it was a, a great success and this was all because of, of these electric streetcars and you see here, this first one uh, was powered by overhead wires. 
Um, and that, um, uh, well, I'll get to that in just a second. So let's look now very quickly at a map um, of, here we've got 1895, as opposed to that earlier one I showed you was 1880. And you can see here, um, you can't make out a lot of detail, but you see the color lines show how the street railways now go way out of the city. Um, you've got electric power, you no longer have the limits of, of um, horse-drawn cars. They go, they go much faster. Um, instead of uh, three or four miles an hour, these cars are gonna be traveling usually around 10, 11 miles an hour. Um, and uh, it may not seem very fast uh, in our modern sense, but uh, they, went, they went quickly and they went out to new suburbs. You've got uh, Brightwood uh, Railway went out uh, Georgia Avenue uh, to the suburb of Brightwood. Uh, the Eckington uh, and Soldiers Home I mentioned to Eckington and out to Petworth beyond that. Uh, the Rock Creek Railway went out uh, Connecticut Avenue to Chevy Chase. That was Chevy Chase was another um, suburb that was set up specifically in conjunction with building the the street railway uh, and building even the road of Connecticut Avenue all the way out to Chevy Chase. Um, you had uh, uh, on Wisconsin Avenue, the Tenley Town uh, Railway was another one um, that used uh, an existing road to an, to an existing suburb, but turned it into a, a streetcar suburb of the city instead of being um, a more isolated town out further out in the district. So these were these were a huge success. All these uh, um, uh, streetcar systems, and here um, I just sort of picked this one uh, very uh, nice photo of of the streetcar system at its height. Um, and this is downtown, uh, right at 15th Street and and Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, you you see the, the the bank building there. The Treasury is off uh, to to the left, and you've got the uh, multiple streetcars in, in view here um, on the streets. This was actually the most congested streetcar uh, intersection in the city. They had the most number of lines connecting here in, in, in from different routes. And you'll notice, um, I, I uh, briefly mentioned earlier the the overhead uh, wire issue, and you'll notice there aren't any overhead wires here. So where are they? getting their power. And uh, the cars are getting their power uh, from an underground conduit. You'll notice that they there are three rails or appear to be three rails uh, for each uh, car. And the center rail is actually, there's really a slot there and a long um, arm coming down from the car known as a plow goes down there and connects, uh, electrically connects to wires that are under underground and that's how they're powered and that was required uh, by by law uh, for all the streetcars within the original L'Enfant City so i.e that is uh, you know we're uh, south of Florida Avenue and and the downtown area that we we know now and outside of that the cars would switch to overhead overhead wires. Uh, so these were, um, this was the height, the early 1900s, uh, 1900s and 1910s uh, was the, really the height of the streetcar era in the city. Everybody took streetcars, they were everywhere. Uh, cars were still a novelty at that time, uh, but that was going to change. Uh, here we've got a, a photo, um, this was a sort of a publicity shot of the new Washington Rapid Transit Company when it was organized in 1921 as the first uh, 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 regular daily uh, city bus service for the city. And these are these wonderful newfangled buses. And they would, uh, they would spell the, the eventual end of streetcars because they were considered much more nimble. They could, they're not, they're not, uh, forced to follow in the tracks. Um, they, can, they can move all around, the routes can be changed easily, uh, and they're, they're thought to be more, or felt to be more comfortable, more modern in every way than the old-fashioned streetcars. So once the, once the buses showed up, um, streetcars were really doomed. 
And uh, here's a, this is just another shot. This is actually that same intersection. Uh, you see the Treasury Department back here. Um, but this is from about 1930. And uh, it's a nice shot because it gives you the, it, it illustrates the feeling that people had when they were down driving their cars, which by 1930 were, were everywhere. And here people, their cars, they had to stay off to the sides of the road because the streetcars were taking up all this center space where the tracks were. And everyone started thinking, well, gosh, those old fashioned rickety streetcars, they're taking up so much of these streets. If we just get rid of them, then it's all gonna be opened up for cars and everything will move smoothly and easily. And uh, of course that was not gonna happen like that, but that's the way people started to think uh, really beginning in the thirties. And uh, here is a view of a, uh, a streetcar that was developed in the thirties, um, specifically uh, to try to, to fight the, the, the decline and the decline in people's perception of streetcars that was going on. So um, this is called a PCC car. That's just the term that refers to the committee of, of all the streetcar companies that developed this car. And they developed it in 1937 and it was uh, gonna be a modern car. Um, it's streamlined. It's, uh, it's the answer to, to the bus. Um, it's more comfortable. It had, uh, it had actual, uh, 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 shock absorbers and, and, and uh, uh, mechanisms to make for a comfortable ride um, and a much, a much nicer uh, ride it was supposed to be anyway than the old, older streetcars. And there was, there was the hope of, of streetcar companies across the country, including Washington, that these new cars would, would convince people that streetcars were still modern and viable. Uh, and the eventually the entire fleet in DC was was switched over to these modern type cars. Um, it would not really uh, change anything, uh, but the the last uh, the last great um, uh, uh, ascendance uh, of streetcars, I guess, was was really during World War II. This was a special case, of course. Uh, and during the war, uh, there were shortages of gasoline and rubber rationing. Uh, people were, were strongly discouraged to, to not ride their cars. So, um, so when the, the trend towards automobiles and buses reversed temporarily. Everyone went back to riding in streetcars and the streetcar companies prospered really well for, for a time being. Uh, this particular, uh, uh, streetcar is especially painted to promote the the Watts uh, uh, service, which was the Women's Auxiliary Transit Service, uh, whereby women became uh, operators of streetcars uh, because the men were, were off at war. Um, and that happened in 1942. Um, the the Streetcar system after the war um, declined further. Uh, there, there was uh, a, a change in management in the 1950s. A corporate raider from Florida by the name of Lewis Wolfson came in and took over the, the streetcar company, which had previously been managed really well and, um, and you know, took a lot of, of capital out of it, um, deferred maintenance. Um, Things, things went downhill. Uh, eventually, um, uh, and, and uh, lines started to be shut down and, and, and converted to buses. Um, the, in 1949, uh, there was a, one of the larger uh, routes, what is now the, the Route 80, was converted from streetcars to buses. And then um, from 1958 to 1962, the entire system was gradually converted. Lines, streetcar lines were shut down and replaced with buses. And here, of course, you've got this scene of the old cars being carted away. Um, the last uh, streetcar 
um, ran in 1962 in January 1962, uh, and and then they were, and then they were gone. Um, so, uh, what have we got left of the system then? After at this point, more than half a, cent a century later, uh, we uh, I've got three three subjects to talk about: the cars themselves, uh, the car barns, and then the other tracks and street fixtures that that still remain. Uh, so the cars, um, the, uh, the National Capital Trolley Museum is, is a great place. Uh, it would be wonderful if, if we could all go out there. Of course, we can't now due to the pandemic. Uh, it, it is not open, but it's, it's worth visiting when you get a chance. It's in Colesville, Maryland. And the interesting story behind the, the trolley museum, uh, as early as 1938, uh, the, there was a, a group of, of, of fans of, of streetcars organized a chapter in DC, the Electric Railroaders Association. So, and, and uh, they wanted to, to promote uh, classic uh, streetcars and, and the joy of riding on streetcars. Um, it's interesting to note that in 1938, as early as that, um, they were uh, organized because uh, there was already sentiment against streetcars. And that, that Electric Railroaders Association uh, was instrumental in getting the, the Capital Transit Company to keep, um, and the DC Transit Company after that, to keep um, uh, uh, at least several vintage uh, streetcars in, in their inventory, even after they would normally have been retired and and those three cars are still around and, and now here at the National Capital Trolley Museum. The, the Railroaders Association uh, initiated uh, founding this museum in 1959 and uh, and opened it up in 1969. It's now been rebuilt and moved around a little but it's a wonderful wonderful museum that has tracks and has uh, five or six different um, streetcars from the DC system as well as cars from other systems. So um, in terms of then the car barns, where the cars actually uh, would be parked at night uh, and serviced, uh, the oldest remnant of that actually predates, here we, 1858 predates the streetcars, and that is the Georgetown shops. Um, and um, uh, before you get too excited about that, there's only really the only thing left of, of the Georgetown shops historically would be um, probably some of the bricks on this front wall on, on Wisconsin Avenue. But uh, this building that you see um, uh, originally was, was a shop for, for omnibuses and then, uh, and then streetcars. And you can see the shape of over these windows um, is... Uh, reminiscent of their of what they used to be as as car barn doors. Uh, another uh, car barn that is uh, still around is this wonderful building uh, that people may know. It's out uh, across the street from the Navy Yard, the Navy Yard car barn. Uh, it was built in 1891, um, designed by a Kansas City architect by the name of Walter Root. And, uh, and this was the, the street, the, the car barn that was at the end of that first major line that ran, uh, that I had mentioned at the beginning, uh, that opened in 1862 and it ran from Georgetown, uh, from those Georgetown shops that I, I, I just showed, all the way uh, along Pennsylvania Avenue uh, to Capitol Hill and then turned south and ended here. Uh, opposite the Navy Yard, and uh, and this car barn is the is the spot where the very last uh, streetcar in 1962 uh, ended its its trip. It went into this car barn, um, so it's been obviously it hasn't uh, been serving that purpose for a very long time. Uh, at some point uh, after the streetcars ended, it was painted this bright blue and people started calling it the Blue Castle because it has these Romanesque revival architectural details on it. Um, and it is now um, 
has a charter school as its major tenant. Uh, another one is the East Capitol Street car barn. And this, uh, this car barn is out on East Capitol Street at 14th Street Northeast. And it was the headquarters of the Metropolitan Railroad, which uh, again, I, I mentioned that one up front also. It, it was the early competitor for the Washington and Georgetown line. Um, and so this, this car barn was built in 1896. Um, it was designed by Waddy B. Wood, a uh, famous uh, uh, DC architect. And uh, it was uh, uh, the headquarters of, of the uh, uh, competing uh, streetcar line uh, for many years. Um, now, when, when the streetcar service ended, uh, and this ended service, um, it sat empty, uh, you know, from 1962 uh, through the 60s and 70s. Uh, it, this sent em sat empty and and uh, run down, and it was finally uh, taken over and remodeled and reopened as a car barn condominium in 1981. So, um, one of our early examples of of effective adaptive reuse. Uh, here is another car barn that was designed by Waddy Wood, um, the Georgetown car barn. It was built a, uh, a year after the, the East Capitol car barn. And this is a, this is a really fascinating structure. Uh, this was built actually as a union station for streetcars. There were multiple lines, uh, three or four different streetcar lines that all met and intersected at this, at this, uh, Union Station where you could transfer. Some came in at different levels. The, uh, the streetcar crossed the aqueduct bridge from Roslyn and came in here was one line and then another coming, the, the Glen Echo streetcar coming across would be coming at a higher level in, in the building. Um, some, of the, some of the walls down here are 13 feet thick to, to accommodate the the, the, the stress and weight of, of streetcars at different levels. So it's a fascinating building. Uh, and uh, it became the, the headquarters of the Capital Traction Company um, in 1897. And uh, one, uh, it, it's, it's held just, it's been used as office space all, since 1950, since even before the end of, of the streetcar era. Uh, one interesting, uh, little feature here. This is a, a close-up of the ornamental uh, 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 cornice on, on top of the center. You can see it back here. Uh, so if you look up close, I, I include in this because you've got these wonderful um, spools with cables on them up here on top and over on the side. You see little cables wrapping around and that's because when this was designed and built in 1896, it was in that very brief period of time when uh, Capital Traction was running that cable system and it celebrates cables. It's the only thing around in the city I know that, that still um, is a memorial to our, briefly, or to our brief uh, cable car system. Uh, another um, later, maybe the last great car barn, um, to use a, you know, somewhat inflated uh, language, uh, would, be, would be this one. This is on 14th Street at Decatur Street. This is the Decatur, De Decatur Street car barn built in 1906. Um, and this design by, by Waddy Wood's firm, Wood, Dunn and & Dunn and Deming. Um, and uh, this has always been considered one of the, one of the uh, nicest designs for for a streetcar barn um, really impressive this was uh, built in 1906 uh, when the 14th street line was extended up here um, the 14th street line uh, was one of those original three lines that were built in 1862 it first went just to florida avenue then it went up to uh to what is now columbia heights it was mount pleasant at the time uh, park road there was a car barn there. Um, and then in 1906, it was extended further all the way up here to Decatur Street. So this, uh, this is now, 
or until very recently, was used uh, by uh, by Metro as a as a bus garage. It's now called the Northern Bus Garage, and uh, it is currently uh, fenced off. If you go by it. Uh, because it is going to be uh, uh, very thoroughly re rebuilt. Um, it is uh, this, uh, the building was, was landmarked, uh, landmark nomination sponsored by DC Preservation League that was uh, accepted, uh, designated in 2012, um, because in part because we knew that changes were coming. And, um, and now here I've got, so there's a Google view um, that shows, uh, shows what this building really looks like now. Now here is, uh, you can see the historic original part of the streetcar barn here, which extended out um, part, part of the way back here. But over the years, uh, the building has been greatly expanded um, as you can see, to fill up a huge uh, space here. And most recently, in 1992, this large uh, area was added around, and even a part of Decatur Street here was shut down and, and, and the building filled in uh, around it. So you have this huge building here now that, uh, that Metro is, wants to, to modernize and wants to basically uh, gut this whole thing and save just the, this facade and the tower and, and these historical elements here and have maybe some retail here and then build a new modern garage and all the space behind it. So uh, so that's an, an interesting situation. Uh, in general, of course, uh, we don't really uh, prefer to have facade uh, preservations going on because they don't really preserve the building. Uh, in this case, this is a special case, obviously. We've got this huge, uh, immense space here, and most of it's not historic anyway. It's not part of the original. So I think everyone agrees that, that, um, that it's okay not to preserve more than, than the area around the front. But the details of how that happens, and especially what new uh, work uh, building gets put in around it are going to be closely watched. And fortunately, because this is a landmark, it's going to get close scrutiny. It's already been scrutinized by the Historic Preservation Review Board, um, which ruled appropriately that, uh, that uh, Metro's plans to do a lot of demolition uh, were not consistent with preservation. Um, and so the case will go uh, to the mayor's agent to review um, this is standard uh, for, in situations like this. And um, um, I'm thinking, I'm hoping that this is all going to turn out well with, with a lot of the review going on. Uh, the neighbors, of course, are very concerned about this too. Uh, this is a huge industrial facility that's plopped in the middle of a, of a residential area. And so uh, residents really want to watch and make sure that this is, um, that this is handled the right way. Uh, and particularly, there's a lot of desire to see uh, to see Metro move to an all-electric system where they wouldn't have all the diesel fumes uh, that they've got now having, or that they've had while this was in operation. Um, Metro hasn't really committed to all-electric, although it is going to be put in electric facilities. Uh, so hopefully, they'll get they'll convert eventually. Uh, so, uh, okay, those, that's the, the car barns that are, that are left. Those are the major ones. We've got, there are a couple others I didn't mention, but um, there are about seven altogether that still stand in the city of, of some 30 that originally were here. But now we'll talk a little bit about the tracks themselves. Um, so the streetcar uh, system ended in 1962. You had all these, these tracks. And they're not just uh, the rails line in, this, in the street, of course, because underneath what you can't see is that uh, concrete conduit that has the, the uh, rails, the electric rails that, that provide the power. So there's all kinds of infrastructure associated with these rails that's embedded in the streets. 
And so um, DC Transit, which was the name of the company when it, when the streetcars ended, uh, was required to work with the city and remove all the streetcar rails from the streets and to do it, you know, within within a few years. And uh, well, that did not happen. Uh, the uh, in the early '60s, so beginning in '62, there was a fairly uh, 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 vigorous effort to remove rails, and um, by 1965 about uh, three fifths of the system, some 90 miles of rails had been pulled up from the streets. Um, and uh, at that point though, the city switched its policy and decided not to, not to just aggressively go out and remove rails, but to only remove them when there were changes, other changes going on in the street that would require it. And as a result, um, a lot of rails are still around. Um, this, I like this, this view uh, because this is from uh, the mid 60s because you see this system going up here. This is uh, North Capitol Street. Uh, well, we're, we're on Florida Avenue at North Capitol Street uh, facing west. And you can see the rails just sort of abruptly end here where they've been paved over or removed on part of Florida Avenue, but not here. And even in the intersection, you can see that North Capitol Street rails are still there for a small part in the center. So I don't know when these rails actually got removed, but I do know that other rails are still sitting out there to this day, more than half a century later. This is a photo I took on G Street uh, downtown um, this is, you might be able to make out the, the building museum here, the pension building on, uh, on the left. But if you see the, these uh, cracks in the street, you notice that, that you've got an even set of nice straight uh, cracks that go down the street. And there's another set over here. So um, very suspicious cracks. Those are obviously reflecting that there are rails underneath the street. Uh, just still sitting out there after all this time. Um, here is a, another picture I snapped nearby, 5th and 8th H Streets. This was about three years ago. They were doing some utility work and they pulled up these streetcar rails and this was an access hatch for the streetcar system. Uh, so they had, they had to cut these and pull them out in order to do, um, do some utility work. Uh, and I'm sure many folks know about the tracks that are preserved in Georgetown. We've got a couple of blocks of tracks on O Street and P Street in Georgetown, west of, of Wisconsin Avenue, that were deliberately preserved. And uh, originally in the 60s, the, the, uh, the neighbors uh, wanted these, uh, these stretches of tracks and their wonderful uh, cobblestone, uh, the streets on them to be preserved to, because they reflect the, the character of, of the old streets. Uh, and they were, they, over, over the years, they became rather uneven and uh, uh, DDOT undertook a, a project in, uh, uh, in uh, 2011 to, uh, to tear these up, relay them, and, and fill them in evenly and uh, to preserve them uh, for the future. So you can see the center, the slot is nicely filled in here. So it's not gonna uh, get water in it and, and decay more. Um, so the whole, the whole system is, is a nice shape now. Uh, so if you, wanted, um, if you wanna see some streetcar rails, uh, you can still see them in Georgetown. Uh, and there are other beyond just rails, uh, tracks that are around and underneath us. Um, there are features in the roadways that reflect the streetcar system. And here's just one. This is, this is a turn in the road uh, where Columbia Road, which comes in from the left, uh, hits where it hits 16th Street. This is 16th Street is over here on the right. And you've got this, this gentle curve that goes around to Mount Pleasant Street. Well, why would anybody design a road with this curve like this? Um, they wouldn't otherwise. This was, the road was designed uh, to accommodate the streetcars going around the curve from 
Mount Pleasant Street to Columbia Road. And that's the only reason that the street has this shape. And there are other streets um, uh, throughout the city that are likewise have shapes that are due to streetcars. Uh, and one of the features um, that, that, uh, that has ended up being preserved are the turnarounds at different spots. There's a turnaround up this street on Mount Pleasant Street. Uh, there's a turnaround at 14th Street and Colorado uh, Avenue, uh, where this station, uh, which was built in 1937, uh, is still standing here. And this uh, area, it's now a bus stop, obviously, uh, but it was, a, it was a joint, it was a multi streetcar and bus station when it opened. Uh, there's a, here is a shot of that station with the streetcar uh, parked by the station and, and buses uh, over here uh, alongside as well. Um, and so that, that little terminal, Metro plans to restore that. They've got three terminals. So that, that one's a, a streetcar and bus terminal. Uh, there's one on Calvert Street by the Duke Ellington Bridge. That was also originally a streetcar turnaround. And then there's one um, on Connecticut Avenue up near Chevy Chase Circle. That one actually was, was only a bus uh, uh, stop. It never served streetcars because the streetcars on Connecticut Avenue, uh, streetcar service on Connecticut Avenue ended in the 1920s before, before it was built. Uh, but those are, those are uh, more streetcar features that are still around. And uh, of course, the, the biggest one uh, really, which uh, is hard to see is the DuPont underpass built in 1949. Uh, we still have the underpass for cars, but the system was built for both streetcars and automobiles. And uh, I included this overhead shot because it shows the complexity of the original system. So right now we've got this, uh, this part uh, from the circle here. Um, this is, uh, uh, we're, we're viewing uh, from the north looking south. So if you, if you move up um, cars down, cars and buses go down, this is a, 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 a bridge over, over one of the streets and then it goes under here. Uh, but further up here, there was a separate entrance in the middle for streetcars. And you can see two streetcars on the tracks um, heading down to the streetcar tunnel. That tunnel went down and then, and then forked out on both sides of the, of the automobile tunnels and had separate tunnels and stations underneath uh, DuPont Circle. And those, of course, now um, are... Um, the the so-called DuPont Underground. Uh, after the, you know, all this effort and expense was put into building this elaborate system in 1949, it was when was used for maybe 10 years or a little more. Um, and then the streetcars ended. Uh, the, the tunnels have not really uh, found uh, a, their best use over all that time. They were empty for a long time. There were a fallout shelter originally in the 60s. Uh, there was a food court down there in the mid 90s. And now since 2014, there's the DuPont Underground, which has occasional um, exhibits there, but uh, is, doesn't use it a lot of the time. Um, it's still hard to, hard to find them for people and, uh, and they're underground, so. Um, so I think that's a sticking point. But but anyway, this was this is obviously another major legacy of, of streetcars. And I want to end with um, with this trestle uh, that was built in 1896, the Foundry Branch trestle. So this is in uh, Glover Archbold uh, Park uh, over over in Georgetown along the along the canal along the the uh, uh, or near the canal. And uh, this, uh, this trolley trestle was built in 1896 to carry the line that went out to Glen Echo Park, uh, which was the people that, that remember the streetcars uh, often um, uh, uh, remember fondly the, the streetcar trips, uh, taking streetcars out along this uh, very scenic route out to the Glen Echo Park. Uh, when it was running. Um, 
uh, uh, at least uh, uh, whites can remember that fondly. It was it was a segregated park, and African Americans were unfortunately not allowed. But um, in any event, the remains of this route, uh, uh, one of the major ones is this tr trussel, which has had a a tough time since uh, the streetcar service ended. Um, this trestle was abandoned and uh, and kind of uh, left uh, uh, with an uncertain fate for many years. In 1997, as part of a uh, of an extensive lawsuit that was finally resolved about the assets of the old DC Transit Company, this trestle was was given to or awarded to. Uh, WMATA, uh, the Metro, um, and uh, they they have had ownership of it since then. They never wanted it in the first place, and they've never known what to do with it since then. Uh, it is uh, it is protected officially uh, as part of the uh, Glover Archibald Park um, uh, Historic District, uh, which was established in two thousand six. Um, DC Preservation League has been very concerned about this, uh, about its rickety, unmaintained condition. Uh, we put it on our list of most endangered places in 2008 and 2009. And um, recently, um, there was a push. Uh, uh, WMATA uh, wanted to, to finally just tear it down to get rid of it. Um, we, we obviously objected very strongly to that. There, there was a, a uh, consideration made by DDOT to possibly take it over as part of a, uh, a recreational trail, a jogging trail uh, that would extend along the, the route of the, of the line. And um, DDOT did a study, a feasibility study of this trestle and, and the other parts of the, of the trail and unfortunately, just in, in January, um, they decided, they finished their study and decided that they didn't, they didn't consider it feasible to, make, to, uh, to acquire and restore the trestle. Um, there wasn't any really official opinion or, or rationale given as to why. Um, but uh, once that was, once that option uh, uh, was taken off the table, then uh, WMATA has, uh, has proceeded to, to try to get uh, authorization to, to tear down this trestle. And uh, they appealed the ruling by the Historic Preservation Review Board that had, had uh, obviously told them they couldn't take it down. And the mayor's agent uh, in September ruled in, in favor of WMATA that it was a, a hardship for them to, to own it. Um, now, the DC Preservation League certainly does not agree with that view. And uh, we have appealed um, this ruling by the mayor's agent, but uh, that was just, the appeal was just filed uh, last month. So, um, so stay tuned as to what happens to this, this trestle. This is our, are, uh, of all the streetcar resources in the city, this one is, is clearly in, in most trouble right now, but hopefully uh, we'll, we'll find a way to preserve it. Uh, so I will leave, uh, or I will end uh, the presentation with my commercial. Uh, here's the, here's the, the cover of, of the book I wrote about the streetcar system. And, uh, and with that, I'll, I'll stop and, and take any questions that may have come in. Um, thank you so much, John. That was, that was wonderful. Um, I particularly love, you know, walking us through like these remaining, um, these remaining futures across the city, because I think they're always really like nice to see and, and look for and, and try to find. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, so we did get two questions so far. Everybody, just, just as a reminder, there's the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can submit questions that way. Um, and if you don't think of anything at this moment, that's fine. Always, you're always free to email us. Um, but we have two questions. One is mostly uh, more of like a clarification. So um, the car barns, I feel like they had multiple uses, right? But can you kind of um, explain to us like what exactly went went on in, in them. 
Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't stop to do that, did I? Uh, so the car barn essentially, uh, they're essentially garages for streetcars. Mm -hmm. So um, they were located at the ends of major streetcar lines. And this is where you would park the, car, the streetcars um, when they're not in service. Um, this is where they were serviced, where you, where you would, uh, all the mechanics would do their work in these car barns. And um, so, yeah, so they're, they're garages for streetcars. Okay, great. Um, and then Juliet asked, um, do you know anything about the small building on Connecticut Ave Northwest in Chevy Chase, just south of the Chevy Chase Circle? Yeah, so yeah, that is, um, that it looks very much like the, uh, like the, um, uh, like that one there. Uh, it, it looks very similar to this one on 14th Street. Uh, that one um, is a is a bus terminal. It was built uh, in the 30s, and uh, it was built for buses. Um, it's on so Connecticut Avenue is a um, is uh, an anomaly in a way in in historic terms because. Uh, Connecticut Avenue had a streetcar line. Obviously, that was the Rock Creek Railway that was built in order to, to set up Chevy, the, the, the development, suburban development of Chevy Chase. But that line uh, was converted to buses very early in 1926, I believe it was. So streetcars were not running on Connecticut Avenue when, uh, when that terminal up near the circle was built. It was built uh, just for buses, but it's built on property where there could have been a, a streetcar turnaround. I'm not sure if one was there, but very likely there was a streetcar turnaround back in the 20s on that on that site. Um, so Teddy said, um, "Howdy, John. What benefits do you see for streetcars, trolleys, cable cars uh, over buses? And do you think we will see success in the streetcar?" pilot on H Street uh, Northeast? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great subject. That's one that, that comes up a lot and that people have lots of opinions about. And um, I, um, I'm sort of, I'm a little, I'm, I'm mostly skeptical about streetcars. Uh, I think in, in our modern era, they have a limited use. The, um, the, the thing about a streetcar system is that it, it takes an enormous investment up front of infrastructure to build the system. And, um, and just as people in the, in the 20th century uh, were thought that buses were such, so much better because they, were, they could be routed so much more flexibly, that remains the case today. You, you lay down the rails and you put in all that infrastructure and the, the electric lines and everything, and then you're stuck with that route. So, um, so, I, so where does that leave us? I think streetcars have their place uh, for limited um, downtown type service in, in certain areas. The H Street Corridor is a great example uh, because that's a a uh, fairly intensive commercial corridor, a specific corridor that, that is um, not already connected with a lot of transit. And so that's, that's kind of a, a, a nice um, spot to have a limited streetcar system. Uh, but um, in general, in terms of broad city transit, they're, they're going to be very hard to set up and maintain and require really high initial investment and people don't don't like to spend that kind of money on on infrastructure so they're, they're probably not gonna get too far is my view that makes sense yeah um, and and Scott asked a just kind of a similar question about the H street line so got to think that into your question as well. Um, and then Rhonda asked, uh, the WWF car barn on 24th, was that for streetcars or just taxis? Um, street, uh, the barn on 24th? Mm -hmm. um, I could look this up too and get back um, to you, Rhonda. I'm not, I'm not sure which, I'm sorry, I, I'm not, um, I'm not connecting with which one that is. Mm -hmm. um, 
Sorry. No, that's okay. No, we I, I'll, we'll look into it, uh, Rhonda, and, and yeah, I'll get I back can, to you about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. we'll look it up. Yeah. Um, and then Isabel, she, um, not no question, um, but when I was a little girl, I would take the streetcar from Barney Circle, change someplace downtown, and go all the way to Georgetown. In 1964 to 1965, I briefly worked for the DC Transit in the accounting office located in the Georgetown car barn. And uh, this was a, this lecture has been wonderful. Thank you. And thank you for the kind words. And uh, thank you for that story. I think that's great. Um, just kind of like the personal connection people still have with streetcars. Yeah, yeah, that's great. That's wonderful. It's always nice to hear people that, that uh, have a connection back to that era. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, and Rhonda, yeah, I see you said 24th and M. So we'll we'll look into that and and, and I will get back to you about that. All right. Um, oh, and then before I forget everybody, uh, as people might be thinking of more questions, I'm going to put some um, links into the chat. So these links are for uh, Streets of Washington, which is John's wonderful blog um, and website and um, a link to his books, if you're interested in, in going to check those out and, and purchasing them. Um, our website, uh, our contact information, and then, you know, if you guys are interested in learning more about the car barns um, or other historic sites, I put in a link for the app and website, DC Historic Sites, if you haven't checked it out yet, our YouTube page or Twitter, Instagram, like all of this stuff that you guys can look at to, um, you know, learn more about this history and, you know, to stay up to date on you know, projects that we're working on, you know, like the, the trolley trestle, like all these different projects. Um, yeah. Um, anybody else have any other questions? I don't think so. Thanks everyone. Yeah. And yeah. And thank you all so much. And thank you, John, so much. This was such a wonderful uh, presentation. Um, it's always such a fascinating topic, I think. And uh, we really appreciate you take the time to present on this. And I appreciate the audience for taking the time out of their day to also um, explore this history with us. And um, again, if you have any other questions that, you know, maybe we didn't get to or you couldn't think of, um, you can always email us at info at dcpreservation.org. And uh, we will get back to you on those questions. And yeah, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day and the rest of your week. And uh, I hope to see you all again soon at future DCPL programs. And thank you again for your support as members. Um, and thank you again, John. Thanks, Melissa. <laughs>